Thursday afternoon, my phone buzzed at 10 minutes past 4, signaling a text from Emerson Burke, my private investigator. Without needing to open it, I knew what it would say. Emerson Burke, she's been served. My wife, Martha Harrington, held various roles, wife, mother, sister, daughter, and friend. Professionally, she was a senior partner at Willington & Compton, a prestigious law firm in Hartford. As part of her duties, Martha managed the caseload of seven junior partners, hosting mandatory meetings on Mondays at 10 and Thursdays at 4, always starting promptly. Being served divorce papers during one of these meetings would undoubtedly embarrass her in front of her subordinates. Knowing Martha, I anticipated she wouldn't rush home but would instead lock herself in her office to meticulously review the divorce petition. Initially, she might find the mention of irreconcilable differences perplexing, though relieved it wasn't citing adultery, especially regarding her affair with Michael Kinsley, a 29-year-old associate at her firm. The division of assets would likely puzzle her too. While we'd split proceeds from selling our homes and keep our respective retirements, the omission of my engineering firm would confuse her. Martha's legal acumen would lead her to suspect something amiss. After a thorough review, Martha would convene an emergency meeting with her trusted partners and associates to strategize against me, her cuckolded husband. My name is Chris Harrington. I met Martha during her second year of law school at the University of Connecticut while completing my Ph.D. in mechanical engineering. Our relationship quickly escalated, culminating in passionate encounters and a deep emotional connection. Our intimate life was vibrant, ranging from quick encounters to prolonged explorations of each other's bodies. We indulged in adventurous escapades, including risky encounters in public places and light experimentation with restraints and BDSM. Martha's exceptional rear end remained off-limits for penetration, though I could explore it in other ways. Despite this boundary, our connection deepened, and I fell deeply in love with her. We made a solemn pact to keep our relationship exclusive, solidifying our commitment during our wedding ceremony, which followed our graduation by two weeks. Held in Martha's hometown of Portland, Maine, our wedding was a grand affair, complete with a picturesque reception by the Maine coast. Our honeymoon in Aruba was a blissful escape. Martha quickly found success in her legal career, eventually rising to senior partner at Willington and Compton, while I managed our family business after taking over from my father. Our life together seemed perfect until a shocking discovery disrupted our harmony. Three years ago, an anonymous letter revealed Martha's affair with Michael Kinsley. Determined to gather evidence, I enlisted the help of a private investigator, leading to undeniable proof of her infidelity. After careful planning and assembling a team of legal experts, I initiated divorce proceedings targeting both Martha and Michael. Confirmation of Michael being served arrived shortly before 6 that evening, signaling that his wife, Rachel, had filed for divorce on grounds of adultery, armed with extensive evidence. This revelation likely disrupted any countermeasures Martha's colleagues had planned, as their divorce petition included a thorough documentation of the affair. At 8.10 that evening, the garage door grumbled, signaling Martha's return after four hours since being served. I sat at the head of our dining table, the arrangement carefully set, with only two chairs occupied and the rest in the cellar. Martha's favorite wine awaited her, while I indulged in a sip of bourbon as she entered from the kitchen. Her heels echoed on the tile as she inspected each room before joining me in the dining area. After settling into her seat, she reached for the wine and took a sip before breaking the silence. I don't want a divorce, Martha began. I know, but I don't want a wife who's been unfaithful, I retorted. Chris, please, let's have a civil conversation. Yes, I've made a mistake, but I'm not deserving of such harsh words, she pleaded. I countered her plea with a reminder of her past remarks about certain behaviors, hinting at my awareness of her infidelity, particularly regarding her anal encounters. Martha's reaction showed she was on edge, but she managed to compose herself. Why did you have to disrupt Michael's family? She challenged. I couldn't help but find irony in her concern, considering her own actions. With a smirk, I responded, highlighting the hypocrisy of her concern for Michael's family when she had disregarded mine. Martha's frustration was evident, but she attempted to steer the conversation back to a more civilized tone. I maintained my composure, reminding her that I had no intention of sugarcoating the situation. 
As she demanded answers, I opted to let the evidence speak for itself, sliding the incriminating material across the table. Martha's reaction betrayed her realization of the extent of my knowledge. Three years? You've known all this time? She questioned, incredulous. I simply chuckled, leaving the implication of my actions hanging in the air. Believe me, Martha, I've done a lot of preparation for this moment. While you had a four-hour meeting today, I've had three years to get ready, I stated firmly, noticing a flicker of concern cross Martha's face, but I chose not to address it yet. For example, we haven't been intimate since I found out. Apart from a peck on the cheek, we hardly have any physical contact. It's been three years since we shared a loving hug, and you haven't even noticed. I thought, I thought you lost interest in sex. Martha exclaimed. That remark elicited a hearty laugh from me. I only lost interest in sex with you. Martha paused to consider. Have you really gone three years without sex? I grinned broadly. Three years without sex, with you. I've had plenty of encounters, and if the videos I've seen are any indication, I've enjoyed anal sex with my partners far more than you have. And the best part is, I haven't needed to use KY to lubricate their dried-up old pussies. Martha sat back in shock, clearly stunned by my revelation. Undeterred, I continued, the difference is, I have video evidence of much of your infidelity. You don't have the same proof against me. Chris, I love you, and I always have. My time with Michael meant nothing. It was just stress relief, especially after you stopped being intimate with me, Martha pleaded. Don't even try to go there, Martha. Your ongoing affair for the past three years is entirely your fault. Don't you dare try to blame me, I retorted firmly. Martha took a moment to compose herself before speaking again. Regardless, I love you, and I know you love me. You're mistaken, Martha. For three years, you've lied to me constantly. You've broken our wedding vows and betrayed me. You've degraded and humiliated me in the worst possible ways. It took time for my love to fade, but I don't love you anymore. In fact, I don't even like you anymore, I declared, watching as tears filled Martha's eyes as she hastily left the room. I remained seated, knowing she would return. And sure enough, she did, this time with a change of clothes and a determined demeanor. Chris, I think you really need to reconsider. I have a strong team at the office, and with the help of an outside divorce attorney, you'll stand to lose a lot. I know Sharon Brown is a good lawyer, but I've already found some glaring mistakes in the petition she prepared. If we can't come to a decision on how to move forward, I'll unleash my team on you. Martha threatened. My amusement seemed to frustrate her further. That's the difference between your team and mine. Your team starts the battle tomorrow, but mine has been working quietly and meticulously on my plan for three years. Your team may start the war, but mine has already finished its work, I replied with a smile. I'll take your word that you love me, although I'm not sure how that's possible after three years of deceit. But by the time our divorce is finalized, you'll probably hate me. The irony is, everything you'll hate me for has already happened. You just don't know it yet. I concluded calmly, prompting Martha to shout in frustration. You'll never be able to turn our kids against me. Martha exclaimed defiantly. I'd never attempt to turn the kids against you. In fact, I haven't even spoken to them yet. I intend to call them over the weekend, along with both sets of parents and our siblings. I'll explain to them that I filed for divorce because of your long-term affair. I'll ask the kids and my family to treat you with respect, and hopefully, they'll maintain their relationship with you. But ultimately, it's their decision. If anyone doubts the extent of your betrayal, I'll offer to share the PI report. I suspect you wouldn't want them to see it, so you might consider confirming your affair, I calmly responded. Martha, clearly feeling the pressure of losing ground, exploded, I'm going to take your fucking company away from you. But I had a surprise for her. My company? Which company is that? She looked at me incredulously. Precision engineering. I'm going to take it over. I couldn't contain my grin. Oh, sweetheart, don't you remember? We sold PE to the Swedes two years ago. Martha's shock was palpable. That's illegal. 
That's fucking illegal, and I'll have your ass. The company is a family asset, and I didn't agree to the sale. I maintained my composure, speaking condescendingly. I never said you agreed to the sale. However, you did grant me a very broad power of attorney for all matters related to the company. Your own firm drafted the document. I utilized the POA to finalize the sale and transfer the funds to overseas accounts. As you do every year, you personally signed our family tax documents, which clearly documented the sale and fund transfer. Good luck tracing the money after two years. Martha sat there, stunned, her mouth moving soundlessly. Leaving the room, I headed upstairs to our guest room. After locking the door, I allowed myself to strip down to my boxers and finally let out the tears I had been holding back. The next morning, my alarm went off at 3 o'clock. I got up, showered, and headed to the airport to catch a flight to Florida. In anticipation of my new single life, I had purchased a condo on Clearwater Beach, across the bay from Tampa. I knew that my revelations had shocked Martha, and it would likely take her and her legal team a while to comprehend that nearly $34 million from the sale of P.E. had never entered the jurisdiction of a U.S. bank and therefore wouldn't be part of the divorce settlement. That was truly a shocker. And as for the second half of my plan, it was set to unfold in five weeks, on the Friday after Thanksgiving, Black Friday. Martha's close relationship with her grandmother Edith would play a crucial role. For the past 15 years, Martha had continued a cherished family tradition started by her grandmother Edith, a nativity scene displayed at Christmas. On the Friday after Thanksgiving, Martha would retrieve the 24 figurines, nearly 175 years old, from a large safety deposit box at our local bank. Each figurine was carefully encased in a velvet box. Our family would spend the day decorating our home, with Martha's beloved nativity scene taking center stage on a straw-covered table flanked by two 12-foot Christmas trees. Poinsettia flowers were arranged in front of the table to protect the precious figurines from curious hands. Every year, Martha would stand before the nativity scene, tears streaming down her cheeks. It was her happy place, a reminder of the joys in her life, evoking memories both past and present. We left the decorations up until the day before returning to work after the holidays, then carefully packed them away. Martha would take the figurines back to the bank the following day, ready to be retrieved for the next Christmas. Most of my plan to divorce Martha was executed within the first year, but one crucial element took three years to set in motion. For the past three years, I had arranged a business trip at the start of the new year. Instead of going to the office, I would start my day in my home office. For the first two years, Martha and I had breakfast together before she left to return the figurines to the bank. Last year, however, my long-awaited opportunity arose. As we got ready, Martha asked me for a favor. Chris, can you take the figurines to the bank before you head to the airport? I grinned. Of course, I'll take care of it. As I expected, Martha's text came just before noon on the Friday after Thanksgiving. Where the hell are my figurines, you jerk? I burst out laughing, causing coffee to shoot out of my nose, just as our neighbor Kate, a 38-year-old divorcee, walked past my bedroom, completely naked. She joined in the laughter, sharing the moment with me. Can you put that text on hold for a quickie before I have to go? Kate asked, interrupting the morning silence. Even though we'd already been intimate earlier, I felt another round was possible with Kate's expertise. As I parted my thighs, she positioned herself between them, skillfully taking me in her mouth. Her expert ministrations had me ready in no time. Once she climbed onto my lap, I guided myself inside her, and she moaned softly as she took me in. With her hands gripping my shoulders and her breasts bouncing against my face, she rode me fervently. Her climax came soon after, accompanied by a satisfying shudder. After a sensual grind, Kate dismounted and took a position on all fours, eagerly inviting me for more. I obliged, taking her from behind with gusto. She maintained her rhythm, adding to her pleasure by stimulating her clit, until we both reached a satisfying peak. As Kate left after a quick shower and a kiss, I noticed multiple missed calls and messages from Martha, family members, and our children. Though I hesitated to speak with Martha, I reasoned it would be simpler than dealing with everyone else. Martha's tone was sharp when she finally answered. 
Why did it take you so long to call back? I was occupied with a neighbor, Martha. You remember, right? I retorted, unapologetic. Her demand for the nativity scene interrupted, but I remained firm. Sure, go to the bank and retrieve it. But Martha was adamant, claiming I hadn't returned the figurines last year. Why didn't you return them yourself then? I questioned, sensing her attempt to shift blame. Her response was emotional, but I refused to be swayed. It's remarkable how you evade responsibility for your actions. Goodbye, Martha, I concluded before ending the call. With a resolve to clarify matters, I reached out to the others who had contacted me, ensuring they were aware of Martha's attempts to stir trouble. While uncertain if they believed me, I was confident no one could prove I had the figurines. Fourteen months passed before our divorce was finalized. Martha resisted at every stage, throwing up obstacles and involving the authorities in the disappearance of her cherished nativity scene. My only response to the accusations was a simple statement. I distinctly remember placing all 24 boxes of figurines in Martha's car trunk. I didn't expect anyone to believe me, but without evidence, they couldn't prove otherwise. In the years following our divorce, Martha and I encountered each other occasionally at events hosted by our children. We maintained a respectful distance, trying to keep any lingering animosity in check. Fourteen years later, I learned that Martha was battling an aggressive form of breast cancer. As her time dwindled, my daughter reached out, asking if I would visit her mother. Entering Martha's hospice room the following day, I found her resting. Watching her, memories flooded back, and I struggled to contain my emotions. She startled me awake with her words. You were right, you know. Meeting her gaze, I replied with a smile, of course. I was always right. But what exactly are you referring to? With a flicker of a smile, she confessed, you warned me that my love for you would turn to hate by the end of our divorce. After everything I put you and our family through, I'm ashamed to admit I harbored that hate for a long time. Right back at you, Martha, I quipped, sharing a moment of understanding. Her smile returned as she asked, do you still hate me? Taking a moment to reflect, I responded, no. Hatred requires too much energy. I simply didn't have the strength for it anymore. And you? Martha nodded in agreement. I feel the same. Hate isn't worth the effort. We spent nearly two hours reminiscing, sharing stories of our past. As Martha drifted off to sleep, I debated leaving but decided against it, realizing it might be our final encounter. After she woke from her nap, we continued our conversation, laughter filling the room. Our son Brian, his wife Sue, and their children joined us, bringing warmth to the moment. Sensing Brian's gratitude for my visit, I bid farewell, giving Martha a gentle kiss on the lips before departing. As I made my way toward the door, Martha called out to me. Chris, can I ask you a favor? I gave a brief nod in agreement, and Martha turned to Brian. Would you mind giving your dad and me a moment alone? Brian and Sue gathered their children and quietly left the room. Once we were alone, Martha spoke again. I was thinking, could Brian's family and Rose's family take turns displaying the nativity scene on Christmas? Would you help make that happen? Black Friday, 2018 While many families were out hunting for deals at the mall on the Friday after Thanksgiving, my family spent the day at my daughter's house. Together with Rose's family, Brian, his family, and myself, we adorned the house with festive decorations. Candles flickered in the windows, wreaths adorned the doors, and twinkling lights illuminated the front yard bushes. Inside, every room was filled with Christmas cheer, but the centerpiece was undoubtedly the nativity scene in Rose's family room. We carefully decorated two towering Christmas trees and placed a table draped in straw between them. Rows of vibrant poinsettias encircled the table, protecting the precious figurines nestled among them. Before I left for the evening, Brian and Rose joined me for one last look at the nativity scene. Memories flooded back, and tears welled up in my eyes as I recalled Martha standing before the display, finding solace and joy in its presence. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel not to miss new videos.